Hello. So I want to share an idea with you guys. We live in a world where we have all the tools necessary to build incredible things, from the IT industry all the way up to computer engineering and data mining. They're all gone through the roof, and we are at the peak of the technology area. But what about the questions? What about the applications that we want to solve with the, all these tools that we have in hand? What are we curious about? This side of the story, I think, will grow in importance in the next years, and this is why I want to clarify in this presentation. So. First of all, I speak from the perspective of a PhD student, uh, researching methods of the brain from a, well, mechanisms of the brain, I'm sorry, uh, from an engineering perspective. So I studied applied electronics at the Technical University of Cluj-Napoca for four years, and after all these four years, I still didn't know what the electronics were applied on. So I said, oh, let's study a bit more. And I joined a, an international master's in biomedical engineering, and here, well, I learned that uh, I could apply the tools that I learned in electronics to develop and understand devices that would in turn understand our body and our brain. But I was just as helpless as I had now had the tools to develop tools, but I still didn't get to the application. So, to my surprise, a three-week event gave me a new perspective on my search to the application. And this new perspective was the fact that I should look for the application first, on what I was curious to find out, and then search for the tools to do this, to answer the question that I was curious about. And this was the Transylvanian Experimental Neuroscience Summer School. And it was a great event. It was a practical and theoretical school that um, explained all kinds of uh, experimental techniques that are used in neuroscience today. And all of this was happening 40 kilometers away from home, in the middle of nowhere. And, well, they were not kidding, as you might see in the next slide. The school took place uh, in the middle of nowhere, as I said, so it was in the Sokolaya village uh, near Gerla. And uh, it was amazing. So we were 13 students, and surrounded by 40 professors and teaching assistants and organizers who took care of us. And what we did was incredible. So basically, in the first couple of days, we built the first two-photon microscope in Romania at the time. And, well, this was quite a novelty. And then in the next couple of days, we built all the necessary software to control it. And this continued until the end of the summer school. We had the most high-tech neuroscience laboratory in the middle of nowhere, at the Pike Lake, Transylvania. And so we found out what the real aim of this summer school was. It was basically to show us that the tools are there for us and that we are ready to learn them, but all we need is to ask the right questions. Oh, this is the very cool neuroscience laboratory. <laughs> okay, so um, this is what I want to share for, with you actually. So we are at the peak of technology, we have all of these tools, we have all of these methods, but this has reached some sort of saturation. So what do I mean by this? Here's a good example. Think about the iPhone. We have one version coming out every year, but do we really use these extra features that it brings? Think about, well, two successive versions of the Nokia phone in the 1990s. They brought very interesting concepts. Each version brought new, new ideas like colored screen or um, the internet connectivity, or actually fitting into your pocket. But with the iPhone series, it's a bit different. Of course, the speed, processor is, the speed of the processor is tripled, and the resolution of the screen and the camera are through the roof. But do they really enable the same degree of progress? Do you really think that the birth of the iPhone 6 was caused by our limitations, our goals being limited by the small screen of iPhone 5 or by its lower memory? It doesn't seem so. So, basically, what I think is that we should ask the questions. But I've kept talking about these questions. What are these questions, really? So, and how can we ask them, if not through the methods? How can we ask these questions looking the other way around, looking at the application and then source the methods? So, the first and most, maybe most difficult step is to define your black spot. So, what is your black spot? It can be a niche or a gap. It can be something unknown or a controversy. And once, once you found it, you, you should ask yourself a couple of questions about it. Look for the, some criteria, whether this is a good black spot or not. So the first one is, 
Is there enough prior information? Is, are people interested in this? Have they done any investigations in the field? If yes, then you should look whether this, this black spot is finite. If there is a limit to it, you, you don't want to know the meaning of life. You want to find something that is tangible, something that is measurable. And then the third step would be, is it relevant? Will the society or research or anybody benefit from the fact that you will shed light on this black spot? And the fourth and maybe most, most important point is, are you curious about it? So being curious about it will, will motivate you to actually go through the learning process necessary afterwards to learn the tools and will enable you to actually reach successfully at the goal that you have in the end. So once all these questions are answered with yes, then you can go on to formulating your question. So in this formulation, it's quite easy once you've done the step before, you need to include what was done so far, so what did others research, where did they stop and why, and basically here you need to state what new perspective you can bring, and then you have to mention why it is important to clarify it. So basically, who benefits, why, and how many people, in which kind of way, how you can do this. And then, the next step is to set an assumption. So basically, think about what could fit in that black spot. What, what you could interpolate from all these things, how you can imagine that black spot being filled. Only then can you think about the methods and the tools. You can think about how to prove your assumption, how to test it. Then you can think about what results you would expect from the tests you will apply. And you can think about what conclusions to draw from the expected results. So this seems, seems like a bit of theory. But what I will try to do now is exemplify all this on my research project, on my, my interest. So what is my black spot, basically? Well, I'm most interested in perception. So I want to know how the brain uses information from our sensors, our eyes and ears and skin, in order to understand complex, complex objects around us. So basically, when you look at a tree, we know that you have cells that respond to different features of this tree. So basically, some neurons will respond to the trunk and some will respond to the leaves. But all of, this, all of these neurons communicate with each other in such a way to form a perception, a complete perception of the tree. However, if you look at the soccer game around the tree, what will happen is that you will not perceive the tree anymore. Even though these cells will still react and they will still communicate about the trunk and the leaves, you will not generate the perception of the tree. So how does the brain do this? How does the brain switch attention from the tree to the soccer game and reverse? So what I want to... Well, this concept can be explained with the following analogy. So imagine your neurons are like colorful balls bouncing around in your brain. So they're bouncing around in your brain. <laughs> uh, so what happens is that when a tree appears before you, these neurons start sending messages. But because of something very similar to tall grass, they will not um, be able to receive each other's messages because the grass will impede the messages to be sent. So when you do pay attention to the tree, what happens, something happens to these neurons. And, and what happens is that they synchronize. And this synchronization makes them all bounce at the same time. And them bouncing at the same time enables them to be above the tall grass at one given point where they have a window of opportunity to communicate and to generate perception. So to send that information in order to create a complete perception of the tree. So here's where previous research stops. This is where people have, have stopped. And now I want to see exactly what happens inside that, uh, those neurons, what makes them synchronize. So my hypothesis, to continue the analogy, is that they, the small holes open in the surface of the balls in order to change the air pressure in the balls, and thus making them bounce in a different speed and synchronizing some of the balls to the other ones. So the neurons synchronize in this way. And this process is called membrane resonance, and this is my research project. So I'm going to use a lot of methods to study this. I will use a lot of tools and a lot of fancy computer simulations and all the way up to live experiments. But I will not mention these in detail because this is not the point of this topic. What I wanted to tell you is what I've learned along the way is that these methods are not important. You should use your creativity 
and your imagination to define your project. Tools are there for us, they're not a limitation. All you need is to ask the right questions. Thank you.